Oh, good evening all, it's good to see you. Probably the microphone is unnecessary, um, but I thought we should have it just in case. So uh, welcome to Field and Faith this evening, it's good to see you all. Um, we're going to have a, a few songs of worship and then we're uh, um, going to have our, our first in a series from, uh, from James this evening on... Biblical Covenants. Biblical Covenants, which he didn't tell me before but I completely forgot. Yes, Biblical Covenant Session 1, I could have just turned round. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you that you are with us this evening. Thank you that you never fail us. Thank you that you, um, no matter how we come, whether we come tired, whether we come expectant, whether we come just because we wanted to come, that you come and you meet us here. Lord, in everything that goes on this evening, may you just be present by your Holy Spirit. And may there be a keen sense of your presence here this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to begin with these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, gosh. Uh, chapter 1 and verses 3 to 4, which says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I don't know how you come this evening, whether you come in a good space and a bad space, but uh, we know that we come to the God of all comfort and the God of compassion. So if you are able to, uh, to stand, we're going to sing together, um, Glorious Day and Hymn of Heaven. So... Uh, um, if you're able to stand with me, um, let's sing together. One day when heaven is filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. The living he loved me, the dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Arising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. They they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. The hands that heal nations. Stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. A living he loved me, a dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. A rising he justified freely forever. But one day he's gone. Oh, glorious day, oh, glorious day. One day the grave could seal it no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Lord evermore, 
singing hymn of heaven now and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations will sing that song of worthy is the lamb who was praised how I long to breathe the air Mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save Standing face to face, the you died and rose. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming out this evening. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll dig into God's word together. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we have the privilege of coming around your word. Lord, help us now to put away all distractions and everything that might tempt us to kind of take our eyes off you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us that you would show us something of your incredible love that you have through the Lord Jesus. Oh Lord, I just pray now that you would open our hearts, open our souls, open our minds to hear from you. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen. So we're starting a new preaching series that's going to go on for the six, six different uh, sermons that we'll go through. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through the biblical covenants that we'll find in the Old Testament. Now, you might have heard that phrase and think, what on earth is a covenant? Hopefully, we'll bring some light to that this evening. But if you have a Bible with you, could you turn to the book of Genesis? If you're not sure where the book of Genesis is, go right to the beginning of your Bible. And mine's over here. So Genesis chapters 2 and 3 we're going to be looking at. So if you want to get your finger there ready for later. We're going to look at the covenant of creation. So the covenant God makes when he created this world. And the covenant of commencement. So what happened after the fall? What kind of covenant did God put in place with his people then? But the question is, what is a covenant? We need to start with that before we go any further. Now, we've probably got in our minds the picture of a contract. That's perhaps the closest thing that we find easy to get our heads around, a contract. If you've ever gone for a job and been successful, you will end up signing a job contract and there will be terms and conditions and you'll be uh, promised money and other benefits if you do what you're told on this contract. Now, there are some similarities between a covenant and a contract. They're not exactly the same as we're going to see. 
So we're going to be looking at a covenant that we find in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Now it's very interesting because in all the other covenants that we're going to look at in the series, the word covenant is used. And therefore some people have actually argued, is this a covenant that we're going to be looking at tonight? Personally, I think it is because it matches all the other criteria of what a covenant is, other than the fact that the word covenant isn't actually used in it. But you're completely free to disagree with me on that one if you don't think I don't think it has any impact on what we're going to get from it tonight. Now, the definition I want to give you of a covenant that should be on the screen behind me and we're going to break it down. A covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. Now, that's very different to a contract, right? A bond in blood, sovereignly administered. Now, firstly, it's a bond. That's something that binds two parties together. We often think of bonds in terms of financial things where you have a financial bond, but it binds two people together. In this case, it's going to be God and his people, and it is binding so it is a bond in blood. Now, what do I mean by that? It means it's a matter of life and death. It's something really, really important. It shows the intensity of the covenants. If you ever secure a contract with blood, that means it's a pretty serious contract you're entering into. If someone asked you to sign a contract in your own blood, you would know they meant business, right? It's something that's very, very important. It shows the seriousness of these covenants. It cannot be broken without serious consequences. These are not trivial things that we're looking at. And lastly, it is a bond in blood that is sovereignly administered by God. And what that means is that human beings cannot barter as part of this covenant. Now, if you go for a job interview and you are successful, depending on the type of job you've gone for, you might have some flexibility to negotiate or barter as part of the contract. So you think of these footballers on transfer deadline day when they're signing their new contracts for multi-million pounds. They negotiate with the clubs to get as much money as possible and other benefits. That's not a covenant. We cannot negotiate as part of it. Remember, it is sovereignly administered. We cannot alter the terms of it. I suppose it's a little bit more like my teaching contracts in my day job when I sign my contract. Now, if you've ever gone for a teaching job, you have no say in negotiating any of the terms in the contract. You either agree to it or you don't agree to it. And everything else is set by well, not just the college, but, you know, it's a national contract for all teachers. So it's a little bit more like that, where you have no say in the terms. You either agree to the covenant or the contract or you don't. So hopefully that's kind of setting the picture as to what a covenant is. But why should we bother studying covenants? Why are we going to do this over the next six months? What's it actually all about? I want to give you two reasons. I think there's way more. I'm sure you'll think of other ones as we go through. The first one is it help us to grasp the big picture of the Bible. So we're going to see six of these incredible covenants as we go through the Old Testament. And the logic is that we should see the big picture, the big story that is in unfolding as we go through God's word together. Tonight, we're looking at the covenant of creation with the promise of restoration. It helps us to see the start of the story. Now, the covenants won't tell us every detail in the Bible, obviously, but it does help us get that big picture in our mind. And the second reason I'd like to give you is it just helps us to see how faithful God is, that God keeps his word. When God makes a promise, he will not break it. We're going to see the faithfulness of God as we study the covenants. Now, I love a good story. I'm sure most of you all agree that you love reading or being immersed in a good story, whether that's in a book or a film. But I think we are naturally built so that we enjoy stories. It's part of our sort of DNA almost. And there is nothing better than escaping into a different world with different characters and a plot that grips us. We love that, don't we? It's something that is built into us. And you know, I often feel a sense of sadness when I finish a really good book. It's taken up a part of me going through that story. And when that story's over, there's a little tiny hole that is missing. That's what stories do, isn't it? They grip us tightly. We invest so much into the characters. But how many books have you read where you've given up after the first chapter because it hasn't gripped you? 
I'm sure you've got a pile of books that you kind of started and the first couple of chapters didn't really grip you, so you didn't bother. Well, this is where we are tonight. We're going to be right at the beginning of the Bible, the start, the bit that's going to grip us. Because what we're going to see is the plot that needs to be resolved. Right at the beginning, we're going to see a crisis that is going to unfold. And it's going to take the rest of the Bible to show us how that crisis is resolved. That's where we're going to be this evening. That's a key literary feature, isn't it? That a book would be pretty boring if there wasn't any kind of crisis or something that needed resolving. It wouldn't be gripping at all. But what we see is a paradise that has been lost and it needs to be restored because something isn't as it should be. I don't know if you've seen the film Avatar. If you haven't seen the film Avatar, I would highly, highly recommend it. Excellent film. And at the beginning, we're int introduced to this beautiful alien world called Pandora. What a paradise it is. If you've watched it, the first however many minutes where you're just immersed in this world and the beauty of it. And they do that deliberately so that you get to care for that place and for the people that dwell in it. And then suddenly you see the crisis unfolding. You see these men coming to attack the people there and steal all the raw materials that they need. And this paradise is broken. And then the purpose of the rest of the film is how can this paradise be restored? And that's what we're going to see this evening. How will the paradise of creation be restored? But at the beginning, we see God creating our world. And it is beautiful. It is a flawless paradise. We see that God made the world in seven days. On day one, he made the night and the sky, night and the day. Then on day two, there was the sky. Day three, there was the land and the sea and vegetation. Day four, he made the stars in the sky, the sun and the moon. Day five, the fish and the birds. And then day six, the living creatures, the animals. And then the key bit that we're going to look at tonight is the humans, where God made humankind. So if you could jump with me to Ch Genesis chapter 2, verse 26 onwards, and we'll have a look at God's word together. Should be on the screen. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So what I want us to do is just pull out six things that we're gonna see just from that little passage there about the creation. There's six things, they're gonna be on the screen behind us, they list, but firstly, the first thing that we see is that humanity, us, every single person on this planet was made in the image of God. What a fantastic truth that is, isn't it? That we are all made in the image of God. And notice in verse 26, I don't want to dwell on this, but it says, let us make mankind in our image. Right from the beginning of Genesis, we are seeing the Trinitarian God. God who is free, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So right from the beginning of the Bible, we are introduced to a triune God. Now, it says that humanity is made in the image of God. Well, an image is not the same as the object of the image, is it? If you go out and take a photo, the photo is not the same 
as the image. So we're not saying here that we are gods because we're made in the image of God. We have to be careful there. But we are made in his image. And the main thing I got from this when I was looking at it is how important, therefore, humanity must be to be made in the image of God. It tells us something about us, our own importance in this world. Perhaps you don't feel particularly important at times. Perhaps your self-worth is pretty much zero. You feel insignificant. Well, that's just simply nonsense because we are made in the image of God. We have the utmost importance. So we must be so careful not to ever feel that way because we are made by God in the image of God. So that's the first thing in that little passage. There is something hugely special about the relationship we have with God because we're made in his image. In Genesis 3, we see that God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the garden. He dwelt amongst his people. That's so crucial, isn't it? To know that before the fall, God was walking amongst his people. There was no separation there. So humanity made in the image of God to walk with God in the garden, to have that relationship with God. How can we ever have that sense that we're not important? We were made in the image of God. But that is the crucial context of the whole story that we're going to look at. Humanity made in the image of God for relationship with God. That is God's desire. So keep that firmly in mind as we go forward, that God wants a relationship with us. Point number two, humanity was made male and female. The second thing we can get from this. Now, there is so much that we could say on this, and I really don't have time to do that. And it's not the main issue I want to address tonight. I remember Neil spoke excellently on this topic fairly recently. But I simply just want to add that the Bible is crystal clear when it comes to gender. It's crystal clear. It's black and white. God made them male and female. There are only two genders. In the modern world now, people think differently to this. They think they can identify in whatever way they want to. But that's simply not in line with scripture. If I could just read this quote from a guy called Christopher Wan, who uh, works for Desiring God. He says, being created in the image of God and being male or female are essential to being human. So sex, both male and female, is not simply biological or genetic, just as being human is not simply biological or genetic. Sex is first and foremost a spiritual and ontological reality created by God. So being male or female cannot be changed by human hands. Sex is a category of God's handiwork, his original and everlasting design. I don't want to add too much more to that, but the Bible is crystal clear when it comes to gender. In fact, if we look at uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them and whether the man and whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That's really, really important. And we're going to come back to that. So before the fall, Adam and Eve were both naked in the Garden of Eden. And this is not the point where we giggle at that, but they felt no shame in their nakedness. Now, 
We've seen already that there are two genders, but also we see that God's purpose for marriage is given in this text as well. Something that is established right from the beginning of scripture, that marriage, God glorifying marriage, is exclusively between one man and one woman. Two become one, as the Spice Girls would say. So God's covenant is that sex is only to be enjoyed within these parameters. And I don't think God's being a killjoy in this. It's for our own good. And as we saw, Adam and Eve were both naked and felt no shame at this point. And quite simply, why was that? Because there was no sin in the garden before the fall. So they were, naked, they were naked and there was no sin and therefore no shame. And where there's no sh sin, there is no shame. So that's the second point, really, about gender and relationships. We see that there is only two genders and marriage is only really to be enjoyed between one man and one woman in a God-glorifying marriage. Point number three, humanity was to have dominion over all the animals, the birds, the fish, but at this stage, not for food. We notice at this point they were told they could eat all of the green plants and all the green, uh, green fruit, but they couldn't eat the animals at this stage. The eating of animals only came in after the fall. I'm not going to make any comment on that in, in one sense, but that's just the way that it happened. But what we did see there is that on day six, God made, the, uh, made us, made the humans, and it was the pinnacle of his creation. On days one to five, everything was good. Everything in God's creation was good. But when God made humans, it was very good. We are the pinnacle of his creation. Uh, the point, uh, point number four is the Sabbath. The day of rest is introduced right from the beginning of Genesis. Remember, God made the world in seven days, but actually he only made it in six. And the seventh day he rested from his labors. Now, I've, I've often wondered about this because I don't think that God needed to rest. He's a God of infinite strength, in, infinite power. It probably took him no effort at all to make this world. But he's trying to teach us something by taking a rest day on day seven. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And he's trying to teach us something really important there about the need for that Sabbath rest. So six days of creation, one day of rest, which is blessed. God is establishing a pattern for us. We see it develop throughout the scriptures. In fact, when it comes to the looking after the land, Israel were told to rest the land for one year in seven. There's good farming measures in that, isn't it? If you keep on using fields over and over again, they will no longer yield the crops that they should. So Israel were told to rest the land for one year in seven. And this got extended as well. So there was a special year of Jubilee after seven groups of seven. So after seven of those seven cycles had unfolded, we arrive at the year of Jubilee in the 50th year. And in that year, all debts were to be cancelled. Liberty was to be proclaimed throughout the land. But the problem is that Israel didn't keep that. They didn't keep that pattern they were told to. And therefore, the 70 years of exile that they experienced, they're a culmination of Sabbath years which had not been kept. God was trying to teach them something through this. Now, it's not just a covenant of creation in terms of this Sabbath principle. It's actually part of the covenant of redemption, of us being redeemed from our sins. Let me take you to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. Let me show you this. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, it says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. So Israel was slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So he's reminding them of how they were taken out of Egypt. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. There's a link there, isn't it? They've been redeemed out of Egypt and therefore they're told, obey the Sabbath day. So it's redemption and then rest. On that day of rest, Israel remembered and rejoiced that they had been saved out of Egypt. Egypt. They'd been delivered from slavery. And this is how we as Christians, I believe, are meant to enjoy the Sabbath. We are no longer legally obliged to obey it in the way that they were in the Old Testament. 
but we should see the Sabbath as a great opportunity to remember and rejoice in what Christ has done for us. That's what we do, isn't it? When we come together as a church on the so-called Sabbath now on a Sunday, it used to be a Saturday, we mark it now on the Sunday to mark Easter Sunday, but we are remembering what Christ has done, just like Israel were told to do when they were redeemed out of Egypt. So I think that's a really helpful thing to keep in mind because we, we don't, it's, it's controversial, people have different, very different views on the Sabbath and some people are still very strict to, uh, to what they do and I'm, I'm not going to go too much into that. I think that's something that we need to kind of have our own conviction of really, so I'm not going to go too far into that, but really we should be just remembering and rejoicing in what Christ has done as we take that day of rest and ultimately we look forward to the ultimate Sabbath where we rest completely from our labours in the presence of God. If I could just read you this quote from a guy called Andrew Lincoln, it's really quite helpful for understanding this. He writes that in the Old Testament, the literal physical day of rest of the Sabbath pointed to the future rest. But since Christ has brought about fulfillment of that in terms of salvation rest, it is the present enjoyment of the rest that acts as the foretaste of that consummation which is still to come. In other words, putting it more into plain English, it is the celebration on the Lord's day of the rest that we already have through Christ's resurrection. That's what we're celebrating, isn't it, when we come together on the Lord's day. We are resting because we can enjoy the, what Christ has done for us. And it now anticipates and guarantees the rest that is yet to be. We look forward to that day. We sung about it when we were singing the hymn of heaven. We look forward to that ultimate rest, that ultimate Sabbath rest that we have to come. That's point number four. Point number five, a bit quicker. We see that we are caretakers. We are stewards of this planet. In verse 15, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, not to sunbathe, not to chill out. It says to work it and take care of it. So even before the fall, man had a purpose in that garden and that was to take care of the world around him. And therefore as Christians, we are caretakers, we are stewards of this planet that we live in. I think we often forget this little point sometimes. We, 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 we think just because this planet is going to one day be made new that we don't have that responsibility to care and look after this planet. But I think we are caretakers. We are stewards of this world. We have this wonderful creation that we've been given by God and we are called to be caretakers. We're called to be stewards of it. And then point number six, they were called to obedience to God. So Adam and Eve were called to obey God. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And this is where we reach the kind of the tension in the story. Humanity has been made in the image of God to live, to dwell, to look after this garden. And they've got this ultimate paradise around them. But they're just told there's this one tree you must not eat from it you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it you will certainly die that's the only command at this stage as part of this covenant that's almost sort of negative don't do that just don't do this but what do they do what do they do well let's go to genesis chapter 3 and we'll see exactly what they did Genesis chapter 3, entitled The Fall. We'll read it and then we'll unpack it a bit. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Notice the way he's twisted the words there. It's twisted, isn't it? It's not what God said. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Notice she's added something there that wasn't in the original command. The devil's got into her mind already at this stage. 
you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. He's a liar, isn't he? He's lying right from the beginning. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realised they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Notice the change there. Before they were naked and felt no shame. Now they're naked and they know it and they try to cover their shame. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They don't want to be in his presence now because they know their shame. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's a wonderful promise that we're going to come back to. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce fawns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said that the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, Adam and Eve were given that very clear instruction. It couldn't have been clearer, but they rejected it. They rejected God's word. They went their own way. They chose to eat what was forbidden by God. Don't we all do this daily in our lives when we choose to go our own way in rejection to what God has told us to do? God gives us very clear guidance on how to live our lives and we still go our own way rejecting God. So in this we see sin entering into the world. Well, what is sin? It's not trusting in God's promises. It's seeking pleasure and satisfaction outside of God when he is the ultimate source of joy and satisfaction. But that's what we do, isn't it? We don't trust in God's promises. We seek our pleasure elsewhere, outside of God. And notice they felt their nakedness at this stage. They didn't feel it before, but they tried to cover it themselves. They tried to sew together fig leaves to cover their nakedness. But it didn't work. It clearly didn't work. 
It's a picture, isn't it, of us trying to deal with our own sin, of trying to work to cover it up for ourselves, but it can never work. We can never undo our own guilty conscience that sin brings. We try and do that day to day in our lives, don't we? When we sin, we try and feel, I need to do this, this and this to make up for what I've done. But we can't undo it. We can't undo sin ourselves. And notice that Adam and Eve hid from God due to their sin. They felt their sin. They felt the shame of it. And they hid from the God. Well, they tried to hide from the presence of God. Isn't that an inbuilt human reaction to when we do something that's wrong to hide. It was just last weekend, I was away um, in the caravan for the weekend and Judah, my youngest son, did something wrong and I went to tell him off. And the first thing he did is ran away and hid behind the sofa to try and avoid being told off. Even from the age of three, it is the natural reaction to avoid a telling off we hide. We hide because we feel the shame of it. When you see these celebrities who have fallen from grace and in court on something, they're always trying to cover their face. They've got their sunglasses on, they've got their hats trying to cover their face because they feel embarrassed. They feel the shame perhaps of what they've done. And we do that all the time, but there's no point. There's no point in trying to hide. There's no point trying to run because the good news is that God did not deal with Adam and Eve the way that they deserve to be dealt with. They'd broken his commands. They deserved death. They ultimately deserved death, but God does not deal with us as we deserve because of our sin. He is so, so gracious to us in the way that he deals with us because he doesn't give us what we deserve. But because Adam sinned, we all fell under the curse of sin. And now we need to try and think how this makes some kind of sense. How is it that when Adam sins, we all sin at the same time as him, perhaps think of Adam as, the, rep, uh, as uh, the head or a representative of humanity. And therefore, whatever he does, we all follow in him. So picture the situation now. It's a football match. It's the last second of the game. And up steps the penalty taker to score an important penalty for the team. If he scores that goal, the whole team wins because of his actions. If he misses that penalty, the whole team loses. And that's perhaps a way of thinking of it. Or perhaps an MP is the representative for the constituency. That might be a helpful way of trying to think about it. Another way of thinking about it, we're going to have pizza afterwards. Now imagine in the factory where they make all the pizza, there's this big batch of the sauce. And someone just slips a little bit of cyanide in the sauce. I don't think they have. I think we're okay. But just imagine now that the, the original batch of sauce got contaminated with poison. And then it spread to all the pizzas that came from that one batch of sauce. Perhaps that's a helpful way of thinking of it. People have sort of debated over which of those two models is actually more helpful. I'm not, not going to go into that. Those are perhaps just two different ways of thinking about how when Adam sinned, we all sin in him. But the main thing is that because of that, sin is a major issue for every single one of us because we have all sinned in Adam. We are all guilty of it. And what it does is it separates us from God. Right from the beginning, we see the crisis that needs to be resolved as we go through scripture. Humanity made in the image of God for relationship with God, but now there's that separation that needs to be solved. The reason there's a separation is that God is a holy God. He's set apart. He cannot stand sin. And as we go through this series, we're going to be thinking, well, how can humanity return to the presence of God? And right at the end of the chapter, we see Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. They were banished from the presence of God. So what are the consequences? Well, to the woman, there is pain and anguish in childbirth. That's something I cannot relate to and I'm not even going to try. But what I think we see here is suffering introduced into this world. To Adam, we see that he has to do toil and hard work. Mankind would have to work long and hard to bring forth food from the earth. In other words, life will be hard now. Life will be really hard. But ultimately, mortality entered the world. Humans no longer had an infinite lifespan like they did before the fall. Death now reigns through Adam. And then he talks to the serpent. Remember, the serpent is a liar. 
he twists God's word. But who is this serpent? Well, if we jump to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, we see the answer. Who is the servant? The serpent. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So this serpent is no mere snake, it is the devil. And he is the one who tempted Adam and Eve. But let me tell you a little spoiler in the story. I know we're only in session one. That devil is ultimately defeated. He is defeated and ultimately he'll be completely defeated on the day of judgment. At this stage in the story, it appears like the serpent has won a battle. It appears like he's gone one up on humanity. He may have won the battle at this stage, but he has lost the war because ultimately he has been disarmed and he has been defeated. This is really interesting. The only eternally destructive weapon that he, the devil, has is an accusation before God that we are guilty and should perish with him. That's his only weapon in one sense. If he can prove that we're actually guilty and that we deserve destruction with him. So if he can successfully claim, successfully prove a claim of unforgiven sin at the judgment, then Satan can claim a victory. But when Christ died on the cross, that accusation for those who are in Christ was nullified. For all who are linked to Christ will never perish. The, sa- the enemy can have no victory against that person. Because at the cross, every sin that we've ever done is covered and Satan's mouth is shut. Isn't that good news? He has no weapon that can harm us now. I love this. He can gum you, but his fangs are gone. He can gum you, but his fangs are gone. However, whilst it is great news that ultimately he is defeated, he is still a liar and he is still a cunning and deadly foe. Listen to what he did. He said, did God really say not to eat the apple. He tries to get inside her mind. Did did he really say that? Did he really say it? And then he twists God's words around because he hates truth. He is the master of all lies. And therefore that is a really deadly weapon that he still has. So what lies perhaps is he whispering to you today? Because he still does it, doesn't he? He whispers in our ears. Well, I think the first one that he does Certainly to me, the first whisper is he might whisper in your ear, James, your sin is okay. Your sin is okay. You don't need to worry about it. You can keep living in it. He'll whisper that in your ear, trying to get you to think, well, actually, yeah, it's okay to keep living in your sin because that's what he wants us to do, doesn't he? He wants us to continue to live in our old way of life. It's a great deception that he has, but it's in complete contrast to scripture. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil, he fought back with scripture and we need to do the same when the devil whispers in our ear. In 1 John chapter 3 verse 6, it says, no one who lives in him, that is Jesus, keeps on sinning. That's a simple response to that lie, isn't it? No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. But sin can seem so tempting. Remember how beautiful that apple would have looked or that fruit would have looked to Eve. It would have looked so enticing. It was incredible. But that is a lie of the enemy. It's a lie of the enemy when he tells us that there is something that is more attractive than God. But we need to find our joy and satisfaction in God alone. And therefore, when we do that, sin seems less enticing. When we find that joy and satisfaction in him. The second whisper, I think he certainly whispers in my ear sometimes, is that your sin is so bad. He goes to the other extreme and he'll say, your sin is so bad. Surely God can never forgive it. Have you ever felt that? That little condemnation, your sin is so bad. Surely God can never forgive it. Well, one of the great Puritans, John Bunyan, he would often despair when he thought about heaven and hell, he felt the weight of his sin at times. And he often thought that he could never be good enough for God. We've all felt that, I'm sure we have. 
that we can't be good enough for God. When we forget about his amazing grace, we can just despair at our sin when we see the horror of it. But listen to what he said. One day, as I was passing into the field with some dashes on my conscience, fearing yet that all was not right, suddenly this sentence fell upon my soul. Your righteousness is in heaven. I thought I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There was my righteousness. So wherever I was or whatever I was doing, good God could not say of me that I lacked his righteousness, for that was ever before him. It was in Jesus, not in myself. Moreover, I saw that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today and forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and my irons. My temptations also fled away. From that time, those dreadful scriptures of God quit troubling me. Now I went home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. I just love, love, love that quote, because how true is that? Because we often feel that our righteousness depends on our own efforts, whereas ultimately our righteousness is in Jesus Christ alone. So it is a lie of the enemy that our sins are too big to be forgiven, because Jesus has endured the cross to deal with them. In 1 John 1 uh, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful verse. And here we arrive at the culmination of this covenant. This serpent was forced to crawl on his belly. But listen to verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right in the depths of despair, we see hope. There is hope beyond the fall because even there in Genesis 3, we see a promise that one day someone will crush the enemy's head. So the serpent, the devil, will strike at the heel of the offspring of the woman. That is Jesus, the second Adam. And at the cross, I think the devil thought he'd won the war. When he saw Jesus on the cross, I bet he thought he'd won, that he had ultimately dealt that blow to Jesus that would finish him off. But he had not won the war at all. He had not won it. The victory was not the devil's. For three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. He had conquered sin and death. And in doing so, he had crushed Satan's head so that he is now a defeated enemy. So right here in the Garden of Eden, straight after the fall, where humanity is plunged into sin, God is making a covenant, a promise, that one day sin and death will be defeated. That is the great hope of this covenant, that it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all despair. There is that hope, that promise of a saviour that will free us from our sin. Remember before the fall, Adam and Eve were naked, but felt no shame. After the fall, they realised they were naked and they made clothes for themselves to cover their nakedness, to cover the guilt and the shame. But this was not sufficient. There's nothing we can do to cover over the stain of our sin. But in chapter 3, verse 21, we see that God would provide the answer. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. All of God, not of our own efforts. Now, an animal must have been sacrificed to have provided the skin to cover them. So this is not just a signpost to the way that God would deal with his people through the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, but it's ultimately pointing us to Christ who would provide the ultimate sacrifice to clothe us with his righteousness. It's pointing us to that incredible work that he did on the cross. 
because Adam and Eve were trying to sort themselves out, cover their own sin with their own efforts, their own garments. But ultimately, because of this, we get to wear Christ's garments, his righteousness, which covers in us entirely. We don't need to do anything to top it up. It covers all of our sin and shame. And isn't that good news? And we see it right there at the end of Genesis chapter 3. So as I come into land, because I've talked for a long time this evening, we're going to see as we go through this series, the big picture of the Bible. Remember that question. How can God, who is holy, set apart, dwell in the presence of sinners? Because at the moment, Adam and Eve were banished from his presence. This story needs resolving, and we're going to see this as we go through the series. How can sinful man dwell in the presence of God? The crisis is great. It's a huge crisis. But our Redeemer is greater. He will make a way, for we have a Redeemer who has clothed us even though we were sinners. We must never try and clothe ourselves like Adam and Eve did. We mustn't flee from God and hide when we feel our sin because he has made a way that we can stand in his presence. We can see that Jesus is the one who has crushed the serpent, releasing us from the power of sin so that one day we can ultimately dwell in the new Eden that is promised the Eden restored, the Eden Mark II, the Eden even better than it was before. We mustn't be tempted to look back and think we need to go back to Eden because God is promising us something that is even better. It's not that we're going to be restored to that. It's going to be so much better when we stand with him in the new Jerusalem, the new Eden that we look forward to. And we can walk with him like Adam and Eve did in the garden for all eternity. And that is the great news here. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we see these incredible promises, even in just the first few chapters of the Bible. We see that we are all like Adam, that we, we all find our joy and satisfaction in things that are not you. And Lord, we're sorry when we do that. Lord, I pray that we would turn from that, that we would see you as our ultimate joy, our ultimate satisfaction. And that we wouldn't need to seek after the things of the world, the things that seem to entice us, those lies of the enemy. But Lord, help us to put our trust entirely in you. Help us to see you as our joy, our satisfaction, our greatest treasure. And Lord, we thank you that even though humanity in this stage has fallen into sin, you give hope. You give hope even in despair. You give that promise that promise that one day all things will be okay. We need to cling to the promises of God. We need to cling to your promises because life is still hard today. We're walking in this broken, fallen world with sickness, with death. Lord, we need to cling to that promise that one day you are making all things new, that one day we will stand in your presence, fully in your presence. And there'll be no barrier, no, nothing in between. And we will get to enjoy you for all, for all eternity. Lord, help us to cling to those promises. In your precious name. Amen. Cool. Thank you, James. We're just going to stand together just to sing one final hymn together. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, Lord, my God, when I an awesome wonder. So let's sing together.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 